Hello and welcome to another episode of Hashtag Disruption Dialogues, a Markets and Markets podcast series for growth-minded strategy, market intelligence, and competitive intelligence professionals. Today, our host Pranjal Sharma is in discussion with Sukant Acharya, Executive Vice President and Global Business Head, IoT and Industry Next at HCL Tech. Hello and welcome to another episode of Disruption Dialogues. I'm Pranjal Sharma. I'm an author based in New Delhi, India, and I am in discussion today with Sukant Acharya. Thanks, Sukant, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Pranjal. Thanks for having me. We are going to be talking about an interesting thing uh, and a topic which is fairly mainstream now, which is Industry Next, moving beyond Industry 4.0. Everybody has now appreciated and understood in many ways the various dimensions of Industry 4.0. But technology doesn't wait for anybody, Sukant. So clearly, we seem to be developing and evolving beyond what we have seen. So can you give us a sense of what this going beyond means? Has Industry 4.0 matured and then we are moving? Or are you seeing an evolution which is a new phase of the same industrial evolution? Yes, yeah, so Pranjal, as you mentioned, this is a very interesting topic and uh, a great question within your set of questions. If Industry 4.0 has matured, the answer will differ to who you ask, whether um, the industry incumbents, how they feel about what they have done, what they have achieved and what value they have created and uh, what value they have delivered for their customers, uh, leverage of the Industry 4.0 capabilities. Our experience says that many companies today are not even fully leveraged. They have not fully leveraged the Industry 3.0 capabilities. And there are many who are in very, very advanced stage of Industry 4.0 capabilities and you know, leveraging those for um, the benefits, building competitive advantage, as well as uh, for delivering value to the customers. Now the question, how it is evolving and uh, what is actually beyond? And why should we be actually talking about uh, beyond Industry 4.0 when the state of the world today is actually very mixed. It's not like one step we have crossed and therefore we should be looking at something new. And now to explain that, let me just uh, go back, you know, let's first realize how this industry ecosystem has evolved. Um, starting from Industry 1.0, which was in uh, 18th century, it was uh, because of the invention of a steam engine which actually made enormous energy and power available. And therefore, a lot of manual tasks could potentially, that point of time, could leverage this uh, new source of energy and therefore could be automated. And that actually marked the start of Industry 1.0 revolution. Then fast forward, so after automation and mechanization and moving some manual tasks to machine-based operation and therefore producing more and more, came the perspective of how you actually make it more efficient, more economical, faster, better, um, at lower cost. And that's when the flow manufacturing started, which was around the First World War, the early 20th century. And it was a very obvious next step. When you produce more and you have more capability, then obviously go to the next step of making it efficient, making it more cost efficient, and so on and so forth. And the flow manufacturing obviously transformed the world and um, until the digitization, computerization, robotics, automation again stormed the industrial world and took it into a next leap of evolution in 1980s when a lot of new you know, computer systems, CNC, MC machines, PLC, SCADA, control systems, all those things came into being. Now, fast forward, 2011, the Industry 4.0 was coined and essentially it was driven by the rise of what we call as smart. Everything becoming smart, connected, uh, centralized. Um, so the hyper-connected world took over and everything connected became the norm. So from rise of factory to rise of flow, rise of automation and then rise of smart. Then what is next? And the next is the era of resilience and why it is so if you see from first revolution to second revolution it took the world one and a half century almost 150 years to be precise 149 years from third the rise of automation to rise of smart it took only 30 years and 2011 was industry 4.0 and already people have started talking about industry 5.0 including sustainability in the mix and some of the new age capabilities around AI and the era of chat GPT and, and, and things like that. So if you see from one revolution to another, the timeline is shrinking. 
So while the change, the gamut of change is increasing between two revolutions, the timeline is sinking. So our point of view, the time is not far when it will be iterative and there will be no 5.0, 6.0, 7.0, 8.0 and so on and so forth. It will be iterative, it will be transformation in continuum. And that is the era of resilience where the industry will be more adaptive, more expansive and future-proof. So, so right. when you say iterative and when you say continuous, you are saying there's not going to be any break, let say there's not going to be a fundamental shift. It will be more of the same, but probably deeper, stronger, faster. It will not be more of the same. It will be different, but it will be much faster and it will be very difficult to differentiate how this transformation is happening. Because if you again take a step back, the model of 3.0 and 4.0 is actually putting a static target in mind. So companies say, okay, I need to inculcate industry 4.0 capabilities. I need to put an industry 4.0 initiative in place and a team in place to build those capabilities and, you know, change my business models. But what, what happens when you put a static target, the world is not static. The innovation is happening continuously and the world is evolving. So it is a faulty approach to put a static target and try to do something. And that is the reason why when you actually achieve something, you figure out that you are not having a competitive edge. The things have changed. And 2023, there is an estimation of $450 billion will be wasted in digital initiatives. The question is why? Why there is so much wastage? If uh, technology is proven and if business process uh, and the models are clear, if the incumbents know what they need to do, considering industry forward zero as a static target, then why there is wastage? Why the value promise doesn't match to value delivered? So the, the biggest reason, and one of the reasons is that we are, or typically the incumbents thinking that it's a static target, I need to do X, Y, Z, and then I'm done, is a wrong approach. It has to be a continuous planning, like short-term, medium-term, and long-term business planning cycle, where transformation also becomes like iterative and what is next. Can you give an example to illustrate this? Because what you're saying is very important, but I think it'll be better to understand it with a case study or an example. Yeah, absolutely. So think about, uh, you know, change in continuum, right? And uh, transformation in continuum. The traditional model, uh, let's take an example of, let's say, predictive maintenance, where you actually, you know, look at what has happened in the past, the historical data of the failure trends, the operating condition and the current environment, the context where the machine is operating, and the environment and the weather and the climate and so on and so forth. So you create a model for, you know, avoiding breakdown and potentially putting the machine, putting the asset on the preventive maintenance model so that the loss function is minimized. So asset efficiency is improved. Traditional model in this case is, it is the function of the maintenance team. They need to keep the asset up, right? So now you imagine the capability of Industry 4.0 came to being and with AI, ML and um, all the data insights and you know combining the creating the model and you predicted the failure, then what? So you predicted the failure, but that does not create value until unless you could prevent the failure, you could actually take down the asset from the operation and put it into your preventive maintenance schedule. You change parts, you change whatever the critical spare parts or whatever is needed, you, you put into perspective. Now you imagine what is happening. It is no more part of the maintenance team. It becomes part of the operations team, part of the supply chain, making sure that the critical spare parts are available. So all these functions come together. And that's pretty much what we call as, you know, value chain giving way to converged value ecosystem. Now, in that case, the continuous transformation model actually leads to working across these different value functional areas and creating a value stream that can evolve continually because overnight you cannot change your supply chain reorder points. Even if you have predicted this failure, you may not have the critical spare parts. And many times, let's say, take example of wind turbine or, you know, the, the power turbine. So the, the critical spare parts are very, very costly, very niche. So you cannot just change your supply chain model or the reorder point. And even if you change, your supplier may not be capable. So you have to work in the ecosystem to actually create value of this model. 
So right. while the capability to create and predict is there, until unless you connect all these dots in continuum, it is not going to happen. So how is HCL involved? I mean, what what is the kind of conversations you're having with your clients? How is this evolving in the marketplace now? Yeah, so I think, as you know, Pranjal, IoT and Industry Next is a focused business within HCL Tech. It's a global business that I head. This cuts across all the industry verticals uh, with manufacturing, auto, aero, CPG, retail, resources, oil and gas, energy, utilities, high tech, telcos, and across pretty much every industry vertical that you name, we work across uh, these industries. We take this industry next uh, vision into reality. We are industry next offering suite focuses on these key themes and the key areas as to what is happening in the world and therefore what will help our clients build the competitive advantage and more importantly, sustainable competitive advantage that is future-proof, that is adaptive, and that is expansive. The way we do is uh, through solutions and propositions where we invest, building those frameworks, building those tools, building those capabilities, and also in many cases, building those solutions which can be just plugged and played as um, a licensed product that a client can buy and, and, and install. And we focus on the areas where this transformation is happening uh, at a large scale, or where we see are the core pillars where this transformation and continuum will uh, will change the business model or is changing the business model as we speak. So it is digital manufacturing, cognitive supply chain, smart aftermarket services, sustainability as a core topic, the immersive experience, digital twin and mixed reality, and the intelligent operations cutting across all the functional areas within an organization. So those are the focus areas around which we build our solutions, build our frameworks, tools, and propositions, and we take to market. So you're saying that the certain sectors are going to adopt this faster than others. And is that your experience too? Yes and no. The more asset intensive industries potentially are more prone to this disruption by industry next. Right. Uh, but that does not by any means say that uh, there is not going to be change in the other part of the world, other other sectors, other, uh, other functions uh, within the industry. But definitely the more the asset uh, intensive the industry is, the company is, uh, the more they will be linked to this disruption uh, on a relative scale. So the heavy uh, asset industries would be mostly manufacturing, I would assume. That's correct. But again, there are also asset operators. Like, you know, right. they do not manufacture, but they actually operate. For example, you talk about transportation, travel transportation sector. They don't own the aircrafts. Many times it is leased or they do not produce the aircrafts, but they operate it. So uh, anyways, they are dealing with the heavy assets. Even if you go to heavy asset versus high cost asset, even the medical, you know, life sciences, pharma and medtech industry may not be huge assets and other than, you know, uh, some of the uh, assets that you see in the provider space, which is like the MRI and, you know, the big machines and things like that. But those are very high cost assets. So it is basically the assets that matter. And today, if you look at any industry, asset operation is, is at the core. And more importantly, I mean, uh, I mean essentially, you divide it to customer operations, employee operations and asset operations. Uh, and asset operation links to both customer operations as well as employee operations. So pretty much every industry is coming under this radar, but on a relative scale, the value of the asset, the value of the things that they do, and the size, scale, and complexity will probably have a relative more impact than the other. Thanks, Sukant. And finally, my question to you is, what kind of advice would you give to business leaders to manage this transition? How should they approach it? That's a great question. And absolutely, first I would uh, start uh, with saying that no single size fits all. Every company is different, every industry is different, every context would be different. And most of these areas, the solutions are actually very context specific. And therefore, the approach has to be customized, tailored, where the core remains the same, the objective remains the same, the framework remains the same, the principles remain the same, but tailoring as to where you start, why you want to start, where you want to start, what you want to do and why you want to do what you want to do and linking that to the outcome, that's the holy grail of the approach that every industry incumbent has to take. 
Now, few suggestions or advice, what, and this is coming from the experience of working with CXOs around the world. First and foremost, when they think of digital transformation, first, we need to think about scale and speed. Traditional world, when it comes to a transformation agenda, it's like a pretty much like a waterfall model of planning, detailing, and you know, all those nitty gritty steps one by one. And in the mix, the concept about scale is completely missed. And therefore you see the world moving into POCs, proof of concepts. And uh, the reality is more than 70% of proof of concepts never uh, see the real world, it never scale. So that's, I think is a fallacy. So my advice to whoever is listening is to think, when you think about digital transformation, think scale first. And the evidence is very, very clear. The pandemic taught us that, you know, the transformation of a decade happened within one year. Four billion people in the world could be vaccinated within right. 12 months. And a lot of examples like that. So I think the scale is, is extremely important. Second is speed. The speed at which things can happen. You know, half of the working population, which is less than 3 billion, uh, went uh, remote uh, in a matter of six months. And there had been a lot of resistance earlier to go remote and manage remotely, you know, use extended reality or, you know, remote connectivity and all. A lot of nuances, but it happened. So if you think scale and speed, I think uh, you will be in the right direction for embracing the transformation. The second set of uh, practical advice, if I may, if I may add, is how do you do about it? And which you know relates to your question. So one is obviously thinking and the culture and change. That's all fine. But what is the real operational or execution level things that you need to keep in mind? First is uh, data intelligence. There's a whole lot of talking about data analytics, data engineering, you know, data quality. All those are tactical. I would say piece of the puzzle. But that's not where the value is created. The value is created having the right data intelligence. So it's not just, you know, the amount of data, but what data you need for what purpose and how does it link to what outcome you need? Because, you know, the prediction is that pretty much every second, seven petabytes of data will be created. Now, do you need all the data to make those insights and make the valuation happen? Answer is no. The world's data, less than 10% are actually used for value creation. So I think that data approach to a data intelligence is critical to think as to you know what is the outcome desired and therefore what process, what system, what assets, what people, and therefore what data is, is needed. Second is micro capability. I think that is often misunderstood, often not taken in the right context, and people end up developing monolithic capabilities which are not scalable, which are not flexible, which doesn't become future-proof, and you start all over again. And there the loss function happens where the digital transformation doesn't add value. So micro capability is a model where you need to create fungible micro capabilities and connecting back to what I was talking about, the value convergent, value chain convergence or converged value ecosystem. So think about what outcome and therefore what functions are linked, what people will be linked, what process will be linked, what data will be linked, and therefore what capability we can build, which will not become obsolete, which can add on, which can be built upon. So the approach to microservices and micro capability is a second fundamental change in the industry next approach. The third important pillar and last but not the least is compute smart. You know, there has been a, in a massive move to cloud. Now the discussion I've started is that the right approach because uh, you know a couple of CIOs I was talking to give up that you know so one of them said my cloud consumption cost doubles every year. I do not know whether my value is doubling or tripling or maybe it's a half of every year and i'm pretty sure i know my value is not not expanding at that scale so cloud edge and in memory have to come in conjunction so compute smart is an approach that is not everything cloud is not everything informized it's not everything edge but an intelligent decision about what to be processed where. And the fundamental principle is whatever has to happen at the asset itself must be happening at the asset. And that's the near edge concept, the in-memory concept where a lot of intelligence will be built here. And, and then whatever has to be pushed to cloud for efficiency and for you know big data analytics and all must be processed there. 
and the projection is the edge will be probably the next cloud and 50% of things will be processed at the edge. So I think the compute smart is another characteristic that uh, organization need to imbibe. So data intelligence, uh, micro capability and compute smart. I think these are the practical enablers to build competitive edge and, and uh, build the capability for the next generation to win in industry next environment. Thank you, Sukant. You've summed that up very well. So it's uh, made my summary easier. I think what you've suggested is to be alert, but be ready for continuous change. It's not a situation today that you can make one shift and then sit back and take it easy. You have to be on constant continuity of change mode. And I think that is something which a lot of business leaders will have to adapt to and change their approach to. So thanks everybody for listening. I was in conversation with Sukant Acharya, Executive Vice President and Global Business Head of HCL Technologies. Stay tuned for more such interesting episodes on Disruption Dialogues. Thank you so much, Punjal. Thanks for having me and uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Hashtag Disruption Dialogues. If you are a strategy or market intelligence professional, we invite you to join our community on LinkedIn, Hashtag Disruption Dialogues.